have scared me. Yeah. I think we'll go ahead and get started with the second segment to the presentation. So I hope everybody got enough to eat in between sessions here so you can be ready for the next one. I'm on TV. <laughs> Thank you. Getting that down. All right. Well, we're very pleased to have Nia Ronsky, a physical therapist, for our next presenter. She received her BA in physical education from Gustavus Adolphus in 1979, BS in physical therapy at the University of Minnesota. Uh, has worked a variety of physical therapy positions, joining Park Nicolette in 1998, so we have a visitor from the north. <laughs> Since 2005, has worked as a senior physical therapist at the Heart and Vascular Center Rehabilitation and Fitness Area at Park Nicolette. Um, they provide rehab for patients with cardiac and pulmonary issues, proof of vascular disease, cancer, binge eating issues, preparing those for gastric bypass. I don't see anything here about diabetes, but I guess you'd work with them too, right? Because we see a sure. lot of those patients have these problems that, should, that are listed here. Supervises. Phase, phase three rehab uh, program for individuals who choose to use Park Nicolette for ongoing physical fitness uh, maintenance programs. Uh, Nia enjoys developing and delivering more formal education, such as today, central to her heart and vascular center rehabilitation assignment. So we're very, very pleased to have Nia Ronsky here to, to present physical activity for the person with diabetes. So thank you very much. Thank you. I am very pleased to be here and uh, yes the areas of the programs that our facility runs uh, none specifically identified for those with diabetes but of course if we polled the audience here um, we would find out that unfortunately diabetes runs through society people with all different um, physical ailments that bring them to rehab are also dealing with diabetes. Um, and I don't really consider myself, though I am called upon frequently to, to speak at the International Diabetes Center, I don't consider myself an expert in diabetes, um, and yet exercise, which is so important in the, in the prevention and treatment of diabetes, um, is something that I do feel like I have at least a handle on. And that's what I'm here to talk about, to, to give you information and to perhaps excite you and motivate you to um, initiate or, or uh, enhance your activity routine as you work to deal with managing diabetes. Uh, for most of you, I'm guessing I don't have to convince you that physical activity is a good thing. Uh, just for the general population, the uh, benefits listed here. I'm not going to go through them real in depth. I bet you know them. They've been explained to you. You, you know them. Um, specifically for diabetes, exercise is going to help with insulin resistance. Um, it's going to help with just managing and controlling uh, uh, diabetes. Pre sometimes preventing and delaying the onset. And weight management, which is so important, so closely associated with diabetes, it of course is an integral uh, factor in that. Here's an interesting slide. I also want to emphasize, emphasize this bit of information in that I just mentioned weight management being so important. This slide, what this study did was compared individuals who were classified, I'll get back here to use the cursor here, who were classified as either being lean, normal weight, or obese, okay? And then the two different bars here, the green is fit in each category, a fit person of these different weights, versus an unfit person of those different weights. And what this slide is comparing is the risk of dying for any reason, all right? So in a nutshell, what this slide shows is that if a person goes from unfit to fit, what happens to their risk of dying for any reason? Gets cut in half approximately. Same thing of, with a normal weight, same thing with someone overweight. So I think that's a powerful uh, 
motivator, a powerful testament to the benefits of being as fit as you can be, regardless whether you're the number uh, uh, on that scale is where you want it to be or not. Now I'm hearing this, uh, when I turn my head, I'm hearing the sound go out a little bit. So if, if, if you are having a hard time hearing me, and Barb, maybe, no, you're not Barb, are you? Jane, uh, raise your hand if, if, I, if you can't hear me. I, and I'll try and keep my head more steady. <laughs> I'm an active speaker. I'm a physical therapist. So I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm kind of a mover. Now this slide is busier than busy, isn't it? And it's, it's one I got from my friends at the International Diabetes Center. The only reason I put it in there, it's, it's their algorithm for treatment uh, for type 2 diabetes. And just the notion, the fact that physical activity is an integral part of that. So the uh, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services back in 2008 issued new guidelines. They were updated slightly in 2008, basically saying that every American, diabetic or not, should get about 30 minutes of exercise uh, five days a week for a total of two and a half hours if it was moderate intensity. And that's generally where I'm going to encourage somebody to start. Um, and that additional benefits were gained if you did more time, basically, is what that second bullet is summarizing. And, that, and in 2008, it was a new addition to also recommend strength training for most Americans, in addition to what we would call endurance or aerobic. And it should be noted that both those types of exercise are going to be beneficial for a person with diabetes, strength training and endurance exercise. <clears throat> Here's a little humor for you. Anybody have a treadmill like this? After months of gathering dust, the Norstein's $1,500 treadmill is finally put to use. So dad's down on the one end and he says, Brad, could you pass the potatoes too, please? So all kinds of jokes about treadmills having, uh, being a nice uh, uh, clothes hanger or what have you. Um, what I'm leading to here is that, as I said, I'm guessing 99.9% .9 of you and most of the people I meet already know that activity is beneficial. Unfortunately, about 60% of Americans, even though they know that, are not active enough. 25% aren't active at all. And that is something, that's the reason that it keeps being presented to you, presented to you, presented to you. And I hope to give you information to help you with your plans. Sometimes we're talking about changing behavior. We all have things we're working on that we want to change. You, if you're working on this one, aren't any different than a number of other people. I might not be having a hard time with the physical activity part of things, but I might be having a hard time with uh, eating properly or whatever. We're all working on stuff. And when you're, working, when you're thinking about changing behavior, these are the things identified by the American College of Sports Medicine as being important and helpful. Uh, and perhaps necessary to make a change. And I'm going to focus on this self-efficacy or competence. Basically, information, I think, helps make people know what to do. I've had so many people come in, and when I give them information or give them an experience and say, OK, this is how hard you should be working, they look at me and they say, well, this, this is too easy. I must need, I need to push harder than this to have some benefit. No, you don't. Well, I can do this. They may have come in thinking, I can't do activity. For legitimate reasons, they have those doubts. But when I show them the proper intensity, the proper type of exercise to be doing, and they leave saying, I can do that, some of them are pumped up. Some of them are tearful with joy knowing what to do. And so that's what I'm going to focus on. I'm a former teacher as well. And uh, so information is king in my, in my mind. I, I need to emphasize that if any of you are just contemplating starting an activity routine, that it's very important um, when you have diabetes, if you're starting an activity routine, to check with your doctor first. Okay, and to get to get cleared, uh, you also may benefit from using a program um, that has uh, medical supervision of your activity. How many of you are would use Mary Greeley Medical Center, or are the, some of you coming from so far that you wouldn't use this facility? Are all of you, yeah, pretty much, use this facility? Well, I just met two of your staff members. 
in there with that nice breakfast I got. Um, Matt, a physical therapist, works for this health system, and Patty Husengay, I hope I said that right, she's a nurse in uh, cardiac rehab. So those two people, they work in different programs, but there are programs available, whether it's referred by your doctor for rehab, or Mary also has options. There's a diabetic exercise program that she offers. I think she said it was $7 a session, which I know could be prohibitive, but uh, if you can afford it, it's a deal to get, you know, attention, uh, vitals while you exercise and so forth. Um, and they also have what's called a, a phase three rehab program. So there's options right within this system to exercise and be medically supervised. Particularly important if you're just starting out and you have kind of a complex situation. Dose response. Basically what this slide is emphasizing is that some activity is good. I don't care where you're at, some activity is good and guess what? More is better. Again, no surprise. More is better for all these things including type 2 diabetes, primary prevention. So here's an activity pyramid. You've all seen the food pyramid, I bet. Here's the activity pyramid. So when you look at this, what things do we want to get rid of or minimize? We want to minimize that top stuff. I'm not saying get rid of it. I'm not, uh, I don't think it's good in any situation to go black and white. But face it, most of us do too much sitting, too much sedentary stuff. And when you think about our ancestors 100 years ago, it's a drastic change now. Um, uh, so to try and minimize those types of things and to maximize the moving about, even if it isn't exercise. And, and I'm going to say that exercise is any structured activity. All right, any structured activity for a purpose to increase your endurance or to increase your strength. That's what an exercise is, nothing to be afraid of. It's just activity for a purpose. But you could do things like uh, at home. I like to promote uh, uh, raking with a rake, if you can, rather than a blower. Uh, hanging out clothes, doing things, flying a kite instead of doing virtual car racing on the computer, whatever. You know what I'm saying? Get out and move and just try and use that body. A pedometer is a cheap and I think an effective tool for someone who's just making the move from being a couch potato to somebody who's, who's gonna make a change, right? Gonna get out there and start moving. A pedometer is cheap and it's gonna tell you how many steps you take in a day. Trust me, the cheap ones aren't accurate but it doesn't matter because if it says you, that you took 3,000 steps today and it says you took 3,500 steps tomorrow, that's all you need to know is that you're improving, okay? Um, so even the cheap ones are gonna be helpful in mo motivating you and letting you know if you're going in the right direction or not. And these numbers on the left are a guide for current day America. So less than 5,000 is very low and all the way up most, the, 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 the kind of uh, mainstream guideline that you hear, anybody know how many steps should you take in a day? 10,000, good job. And, and, and that's what's generally recommended and above 12,500 is considered, is, or 12,500 considered very active. But now look at this. They did a study of an Amish community. What year was this? 2004, okay? And they put pedometers on everybody in the Amish community. Guess how many steps they took in a day? 20,000. You are absolutely right. The men averaged 20,000 steps in a day, and the women averaged 15,000 steps in a day. That's what our ancestors did. Now, for better or worse, there's good parts to the way we live compared to our ancestors, but one of the down parts is that our bodies still need the same things. And we just aren't getting it. We think, okay, I'm going to get active. I'm going to park at the far end. Of, do you have targets down here? Okay, far end of target and walk in. And that's going to, and that's good if that's something new for you. But it doesn't get us back to what our ancestors were doing. You know what I'm saying? If you think of it in those contexts, it might make formal exercise a little more purposeful in terms of giving our body what it needs. Look at that, there was no obesity amongst the, the uh, men. 
and 9% amongst the women, which is much lower uh, numbers than, than we see in, in most uh, communities. And lastly, this one always gives me goosebumps, that last bit. The Amish did not appear to have significant age-related decline in steps per day. Isn't that encouraging that even as they got older, they tended to take the same number of steps in a day? I like that. OK, I've got four little questions here to get you involved and to spur discussion. Not that uh, we have, I have the be-all, end-all answer, but to get you thinking. So the first question for you, Endurance exercise must be done at high intensity in order to get any benefits. True or false? Do you have clickers? Yes. Use your clicker. Don't tell your answer to your neighbor. <laughs> Let's get competitive here. <laughs> I heard false. Let's see if the whole group agrees. All right. So it must be... That's, that's not you. Oh, wait, maybe that is you guys. That looks like a, a standard slide. I don't know if that's really the answer here or not. I heard you say false, and in fact, that's what I would be hoping you would say. Endurance exercise, actually, what do you think? Low, moderate, or high intensity? Moderate. Moderate intensity. Let's see if this, this works. I'm wondering if, if maybe this isn't going to work. Uh, here's another question for you. True, false again. With endurance exercise, so we already said it should be a moderate intensity, you should be able to talk on the phone, on your cell phone, without the person on the other end hearing any change in your breathing or speech pattern. So you, when you go out for your exercise walk, you should be able to call your boss, let's say, or someone that knows you well, and they shouldn't hear you breathing heavy at all. And you're going to be talking just normal. True or false? This. Yeah, this isn't working. Okay, you're going to have to say it out loud. True or false? True. That's true. Because you've all heard the, about the what? Talk test. Guess what? It's false. Who's, who answered false? You're happy. Who else answered false? Good job, good job, good job. Because, yes, you should be able to talk while you're walking, let's say, or while you're exercising. Yes, you should. But if, if I was on a teleconference, let's say I wasn't actually here, let's say I got snowed in at Clear Lake and I was at a hotel and I was on a teleconference and I was talking to you and I thought, I'm going to exercise while I talk to these folks down in Ames. They'll never know. And if I could be on my treadmill and talking to you the whole time and, and not huffing and taking some breaths now and then, if, if I could do that, it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't do me any harm, but it wouldn't be giving me a workout either. I should be breathing deeper and having to take some deep breaths. And anybody who knows you should know that, hey, what, do you, what did I catch you doing? You sound a little short of breath. There should be some change in your speech pattern, but you should be able to talk. So I gotcha. <laughs> Not that that's my purpose at all. These were, Im these were imported. So I wonder if maybe there was a problem with importing. There's just two more. It's no big deal. Okay. All right. OK. Two more questions. Pain is expected with which type of exercise? Remember, I'm Nieronsky, PT. What does PT stand for? Physical therapy. A lot of people like to joke that it stands for pain and torture. <laughs> so keep that in mind as you answer this question. Which type of exercise do we expect pain? What type of pain are we talking about? Really good question. I mean, the previous speaker said that some pain is good. And of course, I would agree with that. I mean, yeah. So this, really, so he's saying that, that uh, some, some people, the previous speaker yeah. said some type of pain is to be expected. And it's true. Uh, what I would, first off, let's, let's answer this kind of the, the generic way and then get into more nuance. Uh, 
I would say none. None of the above. Now, it is very true that I'm not talking to people here who only, I, only have diabetes. Even with diabetes, you might have pain issues if you have neuropathy, et cetera. You might, it just might be part of it. But my point is this, is that the activity should not, should not, it's not a good thing. It's not a desired thing. It's not something you're looking for to increase pain. Now your point, your question, I think, is get, Right, pain tells you something's wrong. However, a lot of us grew up with the saying, no pain, no gain, most of us. And I would really like to throw that out of the American head because it's true. I think what a lot of people are talking about when they talk about pain as being acceptable is pushing oneself to maybe sometimes being uncomfortable or challenged by an activity, and it's true that that if we push our limits, that's how you increase fitness, that's how you increase strength, that's how you increase flexibility and so forth. But pain, ouch, kind of pain, is not a desirable thing. It's not something to be sought after. And yet, I totally agree that in some cases, peripheral neuropathy, arthritis, two examples, where it's unavoidable, but you have to manage it and respect it and not think that it's some kind of badge of honor making your exercise a good thing because you provoked pain. All right, that's my point there. Because a lot of people think pain is good or a lot of people think that, um, that, that that's not a reason not to exercise. They go to the extremes. Last question for you. So it's perfectly fine to do endurance exercise every day. True or false? How many say true? How many say false? Okay, both could be true in any situation, but in the absence of, in the absence of any problem, it is perfectly fine to do endurance exercise every day. Your body might need a day off, your body might uh, need a week off, a month off, whatever, if there's injury or some situation going on. But in the absence of some limiting factor, endurance exercise, again, we're talking about the kind of thing that our ancestors in the Amish do every day, walking behind the horse in the field or biking to school or what have you, things like that. Okay. So information, you have in your packet, I, in my packet it was on the right hand side, this activity guidelines, it's a single sheet. The left side of your folder. It's not in the stapled slides. Yeah, there you found it. Was it on the right side? On the right side, on the right side of your folder, single page, activity guidelines. This is a lot of information here. Um, but what I want to, have you think about is that just like when your doctor gives you some medicine, they tell you how much to take, how often to take it, etc. There's a prescription. They don't just say, here, take these pills for your blood pressure. Here, take this insulin for your diabetes. That's not how it works. It's spelled out. And also with exercise, you could think of it as a prescription. So these uh, headers, these highlights are not marked on your sheet, but mode tells you how, what, what type of activity is going to help you with the different components of health. Different components of health and fitness are flexibility, strength, and endurance. And which two help with diabetes? Which type, which type of, of uh, activity or exercise is going to be the, the two types that help control or manage diabetes? Cardio and strength. And cardio is the same thing as, on my sheet, what am I calling it? Endurance. Very good. So in order to get those benefits, in order to get those benefits, you need to keep in mind a prescription. The prescription between strength and endurance is different. The prescription involves how hard you work, how long you work, and how often. So for strength exercise, Typically, and there'll be some exceptions that I'll spell out later for people with diabetes, but typically this is going to be a higher intensity. 
The duration is not measured on the clock. You measure how many repetitions, how many times you lift the weight. The weight could be your body, the weight could be a stretchy band, the weight could be a dumbbell. And then frequency tells you how many times per week to do that to improve, to get your benefits. So two or three times a week, eight to 12 reps, higher intensity, that's the prescription for strength, for improving strength. Now compare that to endurance, or as we mentioned, cardio, cardiovascular, aerobic, some people call this. This is what's going to help your heart, your lungs, your circulatory system, in addition to helping with diabetes. Look at the prescription there. As we said, moderate is the appropriate intensity. The duration is long, 20 to 60 minutes, plus five minute warm up and five minute cool down. Now I'm sure that makes some of you think, I'm out of here, can't do it, check it off. But read on, please. If needed, split this time into two to four equal lengths of activity spread throughout the day. As your endurance improves, increase your benefit by completing the time with fewer to eventually no rest periods. So if you need to start with five minute walk four times a day, that's what you can do. And as you do it, how often do you need to do it to improve? five to seven times a week. So as you start to do what you can do, it may grow into seven minutes, three times a day, and then two times a day, 15 minutes, till eventually perhaps you're doing more. So that's the prescription. And we will modify it a bit uh, for those with diabetes. So strengthening muscles, that's the prescription is blown up there. Endurance, aerobic or cardio, the prescription is enlarged there. People know they need to get out and move, but when you take it from the, from, the, from the first step, getting off the couch and just trying to take more steps in a day, you know, raking instead of blowing the leaves, hanging out clothes instead of using the dryer on a nice day, you know, just doing just more steps. When you take it from that stage, to the next stage, okay, let's see if I can tailor this activity now and get more benefit from it. That's when this prescription needs to kick in. All right, and the, like I say, the Amish, our ancestors didn't need to worry about tailoring the activity because it just kind of happened throughout the course of the day. But again, for better or worse, our days are not naturally providing it. So you need to kind of be informed about how to take your activity and make it beneficial, make it help you. So a lot of literature says, you know, we've already mentioned moderate activity. A lot of literature says go out and do moderate activity, and they give you a list like this. Well, the people I work with, if I just handed out a list like this, there's more than half of them that would look at this and say, sorry, can't do it again. So rather than saying what you should do, I want to focus on how you should feel how you should feel. People have really a skewed, way off idea of how exercise should feel, how it should look. And some of it comes from watching shows like The Biggest Loser or going to the gym and watching someone else work out and thinking, oh, I need to do that. But what you need to do is, is feel the same way as they feel, not do the same activity or do the same speed or do the same intensity. It needs to feel about the same. Does that make sense? Heart rate. Perceived exertion, perceived breathlessness, exercise precautions, pain. These are all things that are going to help guide you <clears throat> to make sure you get the benefit, but not overdo it. So exercise heart rate. This is a formula <coughs> excuse me, for figuring out uh, an appropriate heart rate with exercise. And yet, a lot of programs, our program still uses in, in our cardiac rehab, pulmonary rehab, cancer rehab, we still use target heart rate, but it's, it's a very, it's a very, um, a lot of programs don't use it because there is so much variability in, in, uh, what, in estimating somebody's maximum heart rate. If you ever have a stress test and you know what your maximum heart rate is, you may, you may be able to use this more accurately. Bottom line though, I think even more important than figuring out what your heart rate should be is paying attention to how you feel, which is what this chart does. Rate of perceived exertion. Basically asking you the question. You go out for a walk and you ask yourself, how hard is it to keep going? Rest is up at the top there. You aren't putting out any effort. You are building up your energy. 
you're resting. If you're at a seven, that means you are now putting out some effort. But it is so light, so easy, that you could do it all day, literally. Let's say playing cards, OK? Most of you are here for a conference. Perhaps I'm presuming that most of you could. You might not like it, but physically, you could play cards all day. And yet, think about this. Think about, uh, again, not wishing this on any of you, but let's say you get the flu. And your friends come over and say, hey, I'm going to keep you company. I'm going to play cards with you. And after half an hour, you think, this is 13. This is somewhat hard. So playing cards might be a 7 today. I could do it all day. But when you are sick, it might be a 13. Same with exercise. You need to adjust your exercise so that it's always in the same zone, no matter the heat, the cold, the humidity, the whatever, that my, the amount of sleep you got last night. You always want your exercise particularly, and your breathing, to be in the middle there. The fairly light, not too bad, somewhat hard. So both your exertion and your breathing should be in the middle. 20 at the bottom, can you think of an example that would be the maximum you can put out? Have any of you had a stress test? Have any of you been in boot camp? Have any, I haven't. Uh, ha have any of you uh, watched the Olympics, perhaps, and watched somebody try and win a race, and they get to the end, and they can hardly stand up? That's a 20. OK, so we don't want you down there. Have any of you watched The Biggest Loser? They push those folks to a 20 all the time. Not recommended. So we want you in the middle, where you wake up the next day, and you feel like, I can do this again. During the activity, you are breathing heavier. At the end of the activity, it feels good to quit. But if it's a beautiful day, and you're used to walking 30 minutes, and it's a beautiful day, and whoever you're walking with says, hey, let's take another little loop, you should be able to keep going if you want to, most of you. That's how it should feel. It shouldn't be a, I'm at 30 minutes, and I'm done. It shouldn't be like that. OK, exercise precautions. I mentioned if you're just starting off a routine, you want to see your doctor. But all of you should be aware to be on the lookout for any kinds of symptoms like this. You would not want to go out and exercise if you're having any of these symptoms. Maybe you do have the flu if you have nausea and vomiting. Good reason to not uh, exercise. And also, it, it, good to know that all of these symptoms, except for the bottom one, fever, all of these symptoms, if they came on with activity, they could be a sign of what kind of trouble? Heart, OK? To be taken very seriously, and you would need to let your doctor know. So paying attention to symptoms. Also, get rid of that notion that pain is a good thing. I want you to respect pain. Any activity that you start, we want you to start conservatively with something that you feel is doable. And you wake up the next day and you say, I can do that. Most people that I talk to, classic, January 2nd, I'm going to lose weight this year. They get up and they go to the gym, or they go to the pool or whatever, and they hit it. Oh, they hit it hard. Oh. They go for 10 minutes and they pull themselves home and do, go on with their day. And then January 3rd, they get up and I'm going to go do it again today. And they get up and they go to the gym or they go outside and they hit and they do 12 minutes of whatever they're doing. And they drag themselves home. And Wednesday, January 4th, they get up and whatever, I lost track of my dates. They get up the next day and they think, I can't do that again today. I'm not doing it. I'm taking a day off. Then the day turns into a week, and it turns into a month. And then, you know, two years from then, they try it again. Right? They wake up on January 2nd. They try it all over again. What you want to work on first is not going hard, not pounding your body, but to work on, what do you think? Look at, look at that handout, that prescription handout. Activity, this one. Guidelines for physical activity. Remember the prescription? Remember the prescription? This is a really important question. Which There it is. Of the prescription, intensity, duration, or frequency. So I'm talking about somebody that goes to the gym and hits that intensity the hardest. They think that's what's going to help them meet their goals this year. What should they work on first? 
How many say duration? How many say frequency? Yeah, good job. Do what you can do and do it every day. And then as you start to feel stronger, what do you work on next? The duration. And the last thing you work on, the last thing you work on is that intensity. Good job. That is a, a big lift off a lot of people's shoulders. Oh, it was written right there. Focus on frequency, duration, and then intensity. Change one thing at a time. And as your doctor prior to this mentioned, important to wear good shoes and equipment that's in good repair. If, if you've got issues with your feet, uh, neuropathy, or you've got other joint issues, consider non-weight bearing activity like swimming or biking. Even varying the activity. Some people that maybe have issues like that, maybe they can handle walking one day, but then the next day they bike or they get in the pool the next day. Try upper extremity support. What do I mean by this? I'll tell you, my mom, she's 89, and she's had two knees replaced, and she's overweight, and bless her heart, she's, she goes swimming every day, but she can't really walk. But I got her a pair of these trekking poles. Have you ever seen people out with those? They're kind of like ski poles, and, and people walk with them. She can walk twice as long, twice as far with them as without just because it takes a little pressure off the joints. And she likes it so much more than her cane because it doesn't look old. And she's only 89 and she doesn't want to look old. So, so she likes those trekking poles. And plus, they're on both sides of the body. If somebody says to me, I can't walk, I say, OK, OK, OK. And, and, but then in the conversation, they say, well, if I got a shopping cart, I can go forever. Well, if a person can go forever with a shopping cart, chances are a cane or a walker or those walking sticks or just a stick pulled out of the woods to walk along with you might do a whole world of good to increase your capacity for walking and weight-bearing activity. And then mix it up with other stuff, too, as your joints need to. Oh, important last point there. Pain should be back to baseline for sure within 24 hours. You should not wake, with the exception of muscular pain, if you start something new, you're going to have sore muscles. And I hope you all know what that feels like, as opposed to your joints feeling worse or your neuropathy being worse. It should be back to baseline. Actually, probably well before that 24 hours, using perhaps you know, your medicines and other measures, maybe ice or heat or whatever you use to kind of soothe, soothe your pain. But it should be back to baseline. Okay, If it isn't, and you do the same thing, of course, you're, you're going to end up having this downward spiral that could eventually stop you. And we don't want that. We don't want that at all. So what if you can't walk? The first thing I have to do is tell a story about a woman that came into my, my office. And uh, she was contemplating uh, gastric bypass surgery. And she came in right away kind of defensive, which a lot of people are. She says, I just want you to know, I can't exercise. OK, OK. And she did have some serious health issues. She'd been in a car accident and had some back stuff going on. And, and so we were going down the road. And, and, and then I was asking about her life. And I said, well, tell me, you know, in your day-to-day -day life, how, how far can you walk? How many blocks, how many minutes can you walk before you need to rest? Because she wasn't in a wheelchair. And she said, oh, well, I walk 45 minutes every day. <laughs> So it, to me, it's a cute story because she can't exercise. And for some reason, she didn't think that that 45 minutes a day was exercise. And I was like, wow, good job. You can walk 45 minutes a day. That's fantastic. So number one, um, most people who aren't in wheelchairs, you might have limitations to your walking. But if you can walk, do what you can. Do the amount you can. And then you know the amount that you can wake up the next day and say, I can do that again. Like I say, whether it's five minutes or it's 10 minutes, it may grow into something. It may never be your primary, like my mom. It, it will never be her primary mode of exercise. But you can build it up, and that will help with day-to-day -day life. Just because if you're doing some walking in your day-to-day -day life, it's going to help enhance and make things easier. But if you truly uh, can't walk, we would need to go to arm and other types of exercises. And if your walking is limited, let's say you can only walk for five minutes. What if you did five minutes of exercises sitting in a chair with your arms and legs, maybe put on some music and make your own little routine going, 
five minutes in the chair, and then you do your five minutes of walk, and then maybe you lay down on the bed and you do five minutes exercise in bed. Continuous. You got 15 minutes of endurance exercise. It's kind of your own little aerobics class. You got 15 minutes there. And if you do that every day, parts of it may grow. Maybe you turn that walking into seven minutes, 10 minutes with the chair exercises before and the bed exercises afterwards and see what that walking grows into. So that's one idea. Keep it light. As we said, keep work on frequency and then work on duration and lastly work on intensity. I hope that gives you some ideas um, for, for taking what you've got and building it, stringing it together and building it up. Obstacles. Lord knows, again, for better or worse, there are obstacles to getting this kind of activity in in the course of a day. The biggest one is time for all of us. A lot of people say, oh, when I retire, I'll have time to exercise. And I think, you haven't talked to many retired people, have you? I mean, people are busy. People are busy. We all are. And yet, when you think about it, we know that unless we put taking care of ourselves at the top of the list, what good is that, you know, the other stuff if, if we don't have our health? So making it a priority, scheduling it in your day, uh, can help there. Pain is another big factor. A lot of people get discouraged. They exercise uh, and perhaps improperly and they get more pain and so they think I can't do this. But the truth of it is for a lot of pain issues, inactivity isn't going to help either. Sitting on the couch is not going to make that pain better for a lot of situ situations. And so finding that middle ground is what you really need to do. And again, if pain is getting worse, you can't figure it out, you know, go to see your doctor. Maybe get hooked up with a physical therapist or a chiropractor or somebody that can help you. Um, but a lot of common sense things. I figured out several years ago that I cannot go for any type of walk at all in my flip-flops or in any kind of shoe that isn't my best shoe. So if you know things like that, taking care of yourself and, and doing that. The walking stick idea. Um, making changes gradually. Don't, don't start with you know, the hilliest route you can find. Start with the flattest route you can find. And go slow and make changes gradually up from that. It's going to help a lot with pain. Boredom. Some people love strength training. Some people love endurance and flip-flop. I don't really like doing strength training, but I do it. It's kind of like eating my vegetables. There are other people who get so bored with endurance exercise. They think, you know, I don't want to get on that treadmill and stare at the four walls. Well, you know what? Neither do I. I don't like a treadmill. I don't have a treadmill, so I like to exercise outside. Other people love getting on the treadmill and watching the same program every day or whatever. Make it your own. Vary it up. Vary the activity to, to make it fun and stimulating, both for your body and for your mind. Um, listen to music, books on tape, what have you. Even sometimes um, charting your progress can help motivate and keep you from getting bored. All kinds of ideas. Talk to other people. What do you, you know, ask your neighbors, ask your friends. What do you do to keep from going crazy with, you know, with your exercise? Um, whatever it is for you, whatever it works for you, whatever is going to make you successful is the thing that you want to focus in on. Some people love walking at the mall. I'd rather be outside on a 20 below day with my dog than be in a mall. A lot of people flipped, and there's no right or wrong about it. It's just what's going to make us do it. A lot of these others, I don't think I'll go through them point by point. You can sure read it. A lot of people are a bit intimidated by exercise or they feel like they don't know what to do. So hopefully the information today is helpful. And it being too hard, I hope also the encouragement to make it easier and start with something that you can do will help. Some people are self-conscious about you know, gyms and so forth. And again, you don't have to go to a gym. Or you can find a supportive place to exercise, like your, um, your diabetes exercise program with uh, who's in gay, uh, I forgot your name, Patty, who's in gay. You know, that's going to be a supportive place where you don't have to worry about what you'll look like or anything like that, um, uh, or the phase three program. Um, those are some ideas that might help you get by the obstacles. Weather, you know, just like in Minnesota, in Iowa, I don't imagine it's much different. 
People that say, oh, I walk every day. Well, when it's nice out. And then you ask them, well, when do you stop walking? And they say, I oh, stop, you know, about October. When it starts getting a little bite in the air. And then well, when do you start again? Well, May. And that's half the year. So you really pretty much need an indoor plan unless, unless you get out cross-country skiing or you're, you like walking in the snow and things like that, which some of us do, but a lot of us don't. So make sure you have an indoor plan. Even I have an indoor plan. You got to have one. Um, too tired, remember that sometimes you got to spend money to make money. Sometimes you got to get out there and do something in order to boost your energy. It's true. Okay, so here's information. Heart disease is so related to diabetes. Um, and it's important to take good care of your heart. Uh, we talked about heart rate and your exertion level, signs and symptoms. If any of you have ever had a, or I shouldn't say ever, in the last year, if you've had a stent placed or a heart attack or, or open heart surgery or have a diagnosis of stable angina, you would qualify for cardiac rehab program uh, through Medicare, and, and that is a supervised exercise program that's available to you. Um, obesity, again, closely related to diabetes, and I think with obesity, it's hard sometimes because being on one's feet, walking, sometimes isn't so easy. You might have pain, you might have self-consciousness issues, what have you, but I think if you get realistic goals and not think about what they show on a TV like the Biggest Loser program and think, okay, in a few weeks I'm gonna drop 100 pounds, um, it, it's not really realistic for most people. To concentrate on that earlier slide I showed you about just feeling fit and feeling better and, and focus on the health benefits to your activity and, and be realistic about the actual number. You're going to have to take good care of your body um, to avoid injury. Using upper extremity support can sometimes make joints feel better while you're dropping your weight and so forth. Weight specifications on equipment. Don't get the cheapest treadmill out there. If you weigh 350 pounds, it may not hold up to your weight, and that's just a good thing to know ahead of time. Replace shoes often. They say that uh, shoes are meant to last about three to 500 miles, and if you have added weight on, on you, the, the support in those shoes is gonna wear out even quicker. So specifically for you folks, everything I've already told you here is kind of generic for the general population. And there are just a few differences um, or cautions that um, for those with diabetes that you'd want to know. With strength exercise, um, we, the prescription had mentioned high intensity. And with, for you with diabetes, you'd want to avoid what we call momentary muscular failure. If any of you have ever done strength training um, or watched someone do strength training where they're lifting and they get to that last one and their muscles literally give out that momentary failure, you would want to avoid that intensity with, with strength training. Um, and as a consequence, you might choose to do a few higher reps than 8 to 12 reps, which was on the activity guidelines. So make it a little less intense and do a few more repetitions. The frequency is still the same. Um, two times a week uh, for improvement. Um, make sure you have proper technique and, and to avoid holding your breath. That's the Valsalva. Uh, avoid holding the breath as you exert effort with, with the weight. Uh, as the doctor prior to me uh, also emphasized, good shoes are so important to protect the feet and make sure that you're inspecting your feet every day. Assistive devices, whether it's a walker with wheels or it's a cane or those trekking poles, can help with balance and pain management. Uh, if you have severe peripheral neuropathy, you might want to avoid weight-bearing activity altogether. Um, and then with retinopathy, there's uh, non-proliferative retinopathy. You'd want to avoid high blood pressures with your exercise. And the proliferative retinopathy, um, again, avoid that really high strenuous bearing down, holding your breath type of strength that's very common with strength uh, exercises uh, in the general population. Uh, low blood sugars are the most common side effect with uh, exercise and diabetes. So make sure that you're monitoring your blood glucose before and after. If, the, if your blood sugars are under 70, uh, the Diabetes Center, International Diabetes Center recommends taking 15 grams of carb 
um, if it's between 70 and 100, but to not exercise. I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear. Not exercise if it's under 70 at that time. And it's safe to exercise between 100 and 299. If it's above 300, we generally tell people not to exercise at that time. Um, carry carbs with you, you know, ID, water, cell phone, all that safety stuff, bring, drink fluids. Um, and for more specific recommendations, it can get really complicating, complicated sometimes adjusting insulin and adjusting meds with a change, if you change your activity level and to make sure you have a resource there to get guidance on adjusting those meds. All right, that's what I've got. Uh, and it looks like I have about nine minutes for any questions you might have. And I'd be happy as well to hang out. If we don't get to all of them, I'll, be, I'll hang out upstairs for a little bit, too. Any questions? Yes? Oh, let's, let's get, uh, we got uh, microphones, that's right, so we don't have to use our outdoor voices. Right here. So yeah, there's microphones. Looks like we got uh, two of them roving. Raise your hand if you have a question, and then they can kind of get you in the queue for, for questions. Thank you very much, Jane. Before my question, I just want to say how wonderful walking poles are. I've used oh. them for about four years. I mean, you can get them very inexpensively, yes. Walmart, Target, any place. Yeah. I love mine. And they advertise them that they burn 40% more calories. I've not seen that benefit. I just It's true, though. It, they're wonderful. There, there are many benefits to them. Balance, pain yes. management, uh, this, um, increased calorie consumption. I have a oh. pair. I use them when I go through the woods. You know, uh, I'm a hiker. I like doing that. So many benefits. I use addition. them just walking. Yeah, because yeah. you look good. Anyway, my, I guess my, my question would be... Uh, how, how do you, you know, I think we all perceive that we are doing more activity than we actually are. Yeah. So how do you um, encourage people to increase, you know, when they say, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm moving, I'm doing. Yeah. Uh, but yet you know you really need to do something a little more energetic or whatever. Huh? Yeah. I would refer back again because I get I do get that a lot. People come in and I have no doubts that they're telling me the truth. They say, they say, um, oh I, I, do you exercise? Oh I am on the move all the time. I don't sit down. I am up and down the flight of stairs fifty times if I do it once in the day. You know, and and I have no doubt that it's true. However, and that's good. Remember that. Um, activity pyramid where the inactivity was on the top and then just general movement was on the bottom and formal exercise was in the middle. What I do then is I say, okay, of that activity, do you get anything for strength? Probably not, except maybe every other week carrying in a bag of dog food or, you know what I'm saying? It's sporadic and it's not a structured program. Are you getting anything endurance that's 30 minutes long without a break? Now again, this, this may not be appropriate for everybody, but that's kind of the ideal we're shooting for. So I'm going to ask, how much, what's the longest piece of activity you do in the day? And often when people are gardeners and they're cleaning their house and they're doing errands and they are busy and they're burning lots of calories, they might not have any you know, weight issues, but for their heart, their lungs, they need that endurance. The circulatory system needs that endurance piece. And so I'll just point that out. Do you want, and I'll ask, do you want to do something that would benefit your heart, your lungs, your circulatory system more, that would further help control diabetes? Yes. If the answer is yes, then I would say, okay, take some of that activity now and make sure every day that you get some sustained 30 minutes without a break in there. The rest of it can be sporadic, but make sure that some of it, that you've strung it together so that you got that 30 minute endurance piece and that maybe you have some structure to it. It's the person's choice and usually the most powerful motivator is the benefits that are gonna result. As we already mentioned, diabetes is benefited by strength and endurance, but then you also look at these other benefits right here. If those are benefits that you want or that 
someone I'm talking to, if those are benefits they want, then they need to structure and, and maybe journal get, until they're used to uh, knowing, oh yeah, I, I, I got a habit now every day, I've got something where I go 30 minutes or more and I do strength a couple times a week. You know, journaling might be a way to hold themselves accountable. A friend, sometimes having a friend that, that uh, maybe doesn't necessarily exercise with you, but that you check in regularly. Hey, how you doing with that? How many times this week did you go for a 30 minute walk? I only got three in and I was, you know, I'm trying to do five right now because I'm trying to lose weight and, you know, just some accountability like that can help. But it has to be, the person has to be motivated themselves, but often it's the benefits that will do the motivating. I hope that answered your question. It, it does. And, and then um, not exercising over 300. What, if you Oh, wondering. why? What, what, I, what my colleagues at the Diabetes Center have said that if your blood sugars are over 300, that there's a risk of them going higher. However, it is more uh, complicated than that. I understand that it has more to do with those who are likely to produce ketones, that those are the people that are at risk. But in our facility, we just uh, uh, limit it to everybody. If they're over 300, we do not have them exercise. So for more specifics on that, I'm not the best person, but your diabetic educator would be. Uh, what about if you have high blood pressure with these exercises, quite high blood pressure? What about high blood pressure? You, that is a very good question and a very important thing to be in touch with and, and take care of. If your blood pressure is not controlled, uh, it could be a problem with exercising because it's going to go up. But I'm hoping that if you're aware that you have high blood pressure, that you are working with your doctor uh, uh, to, as best as possible, control that, and and uh, and that and that with that medicine, uh, that you would be able to exercise. Now, let's say it isn't perfectly controlled. I would still challenge you. Let's say that it's 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 not ideal. If you are still doing, like I say, if if you are not bedridden and you aren't still doing some walking throughout the day, your blood pressure is going up with those activities too. So I would encourage you, take what you do and, and check with your doctor first, of course. Perhaps they don't want you to do it if it's really uh, out of control right now. But, but you may be able to just work on, for instance, if you're used to walking through the house and cleaning, you may be able to take that intensity of walking and just work on making it longer. You know what I mean? Not working any harder, but just working on making it longer. And you could get benefits with it without increasing your blood pressure any more than you do just through the course of your regular day. So, so I, I guess, was asking about weight, yeah. weight and too much intensity. Yeah. If you're, I'll say you're already on a maximum of five uh, blood pressure medications. Yeah. And, and what is your blood pressure at rest? Maybe we should talk afterwards, but you know, your blood pressure will go up. We do not stop people from exercising unless that top number gets above 200 and the bottom number gets above 100, okay? So those are, those are the guidelines. It is going to go up, but it's not anything to worry about if you're under those, those numbers. And that's an advantage, too, of coming to a facility like Patty's or, or Matt, the PT. You know, they're going to be able to check your blood pressure. Does that sound guidelines like that you would agree with? So that's an advantage to coming to the diabetes exercise program because they're going to be able to check your blood pressure while you're exercising, not just what is it in the chair. And in fact, I'd like to point out sometimes, especially people who have that white coat syndrome, sometimes their blood pressure is higher when they're sitting in the chair than when they're out doing walking. Um, so, so it would be a good bit of information to see what is it going up to when, when you exercise. We got a question here and there. I need microphones, I guess, or you can holler it out if you got. Are, are the people a lot healthier? Well, you know, health is, and I'm I'm not going to be able to answer this, but it's a great question to wonder about. I mean, you 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 can just imagine what their diet might be: meat and potatoes and gravy, and and yet they're getting all this activity. And so, in terms of global health. That would be a great study. I don't know. I don't know. But there were a couple things that were significant there. No age-related decline with steps. To me, that, that feels like, I would guess, 
in general, maybe their health must be better, but, but I don't know. Um, I don't walk as much as I used to, but I do, a, I mean, I walk from Des Moines to Czechoslovakia in my day, you know, uh, 30 years ago. But that is my primary form of exercise is to walk. Yeah. And it's like so much so that people around here, and it's like the diabetic nurse said, I walk too much. Ah. And I don't believe that for a word because it's like a, I, I never learned how to do it. But that's what she told me I should be doing. When I walked in, when I had diabetes, when I was diagnosed with diabetes, I walked in here and they checked my blood sugar and it was 1,086. Oh. And they told me I would have been dead in a week. I mean, it's, I don't know how I broke the instrument when they first registered it. And it's like, I don't know, I don't know. When I look at those numbers that I see them in the morning, I don't understand what they're talking about uh, or in the evening. Your blood sugars. It doesn't seem to make any difference to me. It doesn't depend on what I eat. So you feel like you're doing a good job with your exercise. Sometimes I do and sometimes I don't. And, and I think that consistency would definitely be a help in the long run with, you know, the A1C and so forth, getting a lifestyle of it, of, of regular activity. Um, and yet, your blood, what's not regular? My lifestyle. Lifestyle. And, and, and I, mean, I guess that... Yeah. Yeah. And I guess that's probably my number one pitch. You aren't alone in that. Most people's lives, unless they make a conscious effort, most people's lives would have sporadic amounts of activity in them, mine included. I'm a physical therapist, so I get a lot of steps in my job, but I do not get 30 minutes of continuous activity. So. Most of us, you know, we don't have mail carriers anymore that walk from downtown out and do their uh, route and back downtown at the end of the day. We don't have jobs like that. So most of us would be in a similar situation. And I guess that's my point is to take a conscious effort, make a conscious plan for activity and do try and do regardless of the day. If it's rainy, okay, this is what I do when it's rainy. I go to this, I go to Target and walk with the cart or whatever. When it's nice out, I go down by the river and walk. You know, have a plan to make sure that it is happening. I guess that's my point, because you are not alone. Let's talk afterwards. Any other questions? Yes. I love, <clears throat> excuse me, I love to swim. Yeah but there is no really swimming pool in this area that's open in the winter for people to swim. Yeah, no, I indoor, heard. And I like an indoor pool. An indoor pool. I heard there's a rec center, Pat, Patty from Cardiac Rehab said that there's a couple rec centers. That they're it's outside. Are they outside? Mm -hmm. The new there's one in, is. And I'm not from here, so I don't know. Who could, who could help her out with that? Yeah. Uh, I go to the Gateway Hotel. Oh. up in price. It's nope. true, the, the, the financial piece of it is prohibitive. Wow, that's a good deal. Still a lot of and we have uh, a fitness center on North Stang that has an indoor pool that you may want to look into. I have no idea what the cost is, but it's certainly worth your investigation. Another place to check might be commu um, community education. I know it, where I live, yeah, fitness centers, of course, hotels, um, but also community ed. Where I live, we get a little cat catalog from the schools every quarter, and a lot of times the, the school pool is open and available at what I think is a reasonable price, like $25 for uh, a quarter of the year to use as much as you want. So that might be another source. Yeah. They should also check their insurance. Some insurance. Oh. Very good points. Check your insurance because insurance sometimes uh, reimburses. I know my mom gets her whole Y membership paid by her insurance company. Yes. Looks like we are out of time, but I will hang out upstairs for a little bit. If you have any questions, I love questions. Thank you so much. Have fun. Be safe.